So good morning, everyone. So I want to welcome you all to our second annual 60 Second Slam. I'm Rebecca Bushnell, and I'm Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences, and it's a pleasure to see so many of you here today for this event. I, I always enjoy the opportunity to greet alumni when they return to campus, and it's especially enjoyable for me today to be able to showcase our wonderful faculty and students. So the 60-second lecture series has been a signature SAS program since 2003. So originally it was offered as a kind of fun outdoor event during summer sessions, but then we quickly realized this was something that our entire campus community might enjoy, and so we began to hold the series every year, once in the fall and then again in the spring. And then we also realized the lectures were an excellent way to showcase our diverse faculty to a wider audience off campus, and so we began hosting uh, the talks online and sharing them with alumni. So today, in fact, if you like what you hear today, you will find a library of nearly 70 lectures on the SAS website. And you'll also find us on YouTube and at iTunes U. But enough of history, so let's turn to today's program. So our speakers today include 10 students and faculty who will give you their condensed take on everything from infant learning to rare earth elements. And because there is a slam, there is an element of competition. And we have with us today a team of student judges who will be evaluating each talk based on its content, its delivery, and of course, its brevity. Um, and I can introduce um, uh, our judges, uh, Nadja Mason, you wanted to stand up, Nadja? Okay, Elizabeth Kopeck, and Jacob Finkel. Okay, so thanks to them for coming today to help us out. Now, but in, so at the end of the program, the judges will announce uh, their winner. Uh, but in addition, you, we will have an opportunity for your voice to be heard. The, uh, there will be an audience choice award presented on the basis of your votes. And at the conclusion of the talks, um, Juliana here, who will give you instructions on how to cast your vote. So do stick around for that and funds, and there are some lovely prizes. Um, so with that, I'm going to begin with a talk of my own. And the title is for my talk, Will the Liberal Arts Set You Free? Judges, you may start your timers now. If you look up the term liberal in the Oxford English Dictionary, it leads right to the liberal arts. They are the areas of learning that are worthy of a free man, since liberal comes from the Latin word meaning free, liber. In medieval times, the liberal arts were grammar, logic, rhetoric, geometry, arithmetic, astronomy, and music. Now there's an uncomfortable history here because what was originally meant by a free man is a gentleman whose freedom lies in not having to work. Mechanical, mechanical or servile training as opposed to the liberal arts is for people who must work. But today I believe the liberal arts mean something different while preserving that connection to freedom. The new liberal arts are the arts of communication, quantitative and historical analysis, design, scientific inquiry, and innovation, just to name a few. People with this kind of expertise are desperately needed to manage our complex and diverse world, which is so torn apart by misunderstanding, ignorance, and incompetence. In a world where you need cross-training and the agility to adapt to changing circumstances, a narrow professional training constrains you to a one-way track. A liberal arts education will set you free. Thanks. Now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Elika Bergelson. Elika is a doctoral student in psychology, and she works with infants to determine when they first begin to learn the meanings of words. And towards this goal, she's received an NSF Graduate Research Fellowship and an NSF IGERT grant. And the top of Elika's talk today is word learning in young infants. Please welcome Elika Bergelson. Hello. My research, along with Dr. Dan Swingley in the psychology department, is about how babies learn their earliest words. Language acquisition is a miraculous process whereby tiny babies become fluent speakers of whatever language they're exposed to in just a few short years. In our research, we're particularly interested in how and when infants understand their first words, since comprehension precedes production. That is, babies know a lot more than they can say. The received wisdom on the timeline of language acquisition is that basically babies figure out all the sound stuff first. What sounds form categories, where words begin and end, that kind of thing, from birth to about six to ten months. And only then do they start to get some of the meanings figured out around 12 months or so. 
followed by learning the basics of syntax by around two years of age. In our lab, we look at infants' eye movements to figure out what they know. We show, for instance, a photo of a mouse and an apple on a screen, and babies here look at the apple, and we measure where they look. And what we found is pretty surprisingly, already at six months, before they're walking, talking, or frankly doing much of anything interesting, they're showing knowledge of some word meanings, specifically words for foods and body parts. And a little bit later, around 10 to 13 months, they're showing some knowledge of more complicated words like uh-oh and eat. And for both simple and complex words, their level of knowledge really takes off at about 14 months. Now these findings mean that we have to ask a lot of really hard questions about how infants are learning words so precociously and whether or not learning the sound structure of language actually precedes learning meanings. In any event, be careful what you say around your little babies because not only are they listening, but from about six months on, they're understanding a little bit too. Thank you. So thank you, Elika. Now next up is senior English student, uh, Anthony Franco Macaro, and as a communication within the curriculum senior advisor, he helps students become more effective public speakers. He's also part of Big Brothers, Big Sisters on campus, as well as the RAP line, an anonymous and confidential service students can use for information and support. So today, Anthony will talk about the pent up energy, forever red and blue. Please welcome Anthony Franco Macaro. Our beloved founder once said, all mankind is divided into three classes, those that are immovable, those that are movable, and those that move. With all due respect to Mr. Benjamin Franklin, I disagree. In my four years at the University of Pennsylvania and through my work with the Penn Women's Center, I have come to see that Penn students consistently break this mold. They don't fall into just one category. Instead, they fall into all three. First, Penn students are immovable in their convictions. As a member of the Take Back the Night Planning Committee, I have witnessed tremendous activism on this campus. I have been inspired by individuals who will stop at nothing in their mission to end domestic violence and to ensure gender equality for all. So many of my peers exhibit this same unwavering passion in their respective fields. While the men and women of the red and blue may be immovable in some ways, they are movable in their willingness to challenge their perspectives on life. As a member of a group called One in Four, I've spent time presenting to fraternities on the topic of sexual assault prevention and how we as men can help those who have survived it. Now during our presentations, I've seen countless resistant fraternity members who go on to accept the uncomfortable reality of sexual violence and who then become passionate supporters of sexual assault survivors. The environment here at Penn allows for this sort of dialogue. It allows for this understanding and it even allows for personal transformation. Lastly, we Quakers are always on the move. After working with so many remarkable individuals and seeing the positive change one can affect, this college has left me bubbling with pent-up energy and the knowledge that I can make a difference if I try hard enough. I'll be moving on and attending law school next year and hopefully one day serving as a legal advocate for those who have been stripped of their voice. Now, I'm not sure Ben Franklin realized what he was building here at the University of Pennsylvania, but Quakers are a rare breed. They are the immovable, the movable, the always moving, the red, and the blue, forever. And how appropriate for this weekend. Um, thank you, Anthony. Now, I'd like you all to join me in welcoming Eric Shelter. Eric is an assistant professor of chemistry, and he specializes in inorganic and materials chemistry. And Eric's working on to develop new sources of rare earth's elements, which often have renewable energy applications. And this research could potentially lessen the extent to which the US depends on other countries to supply those resources. And the title of Eric's talk today is The Chemistry and Geopolitics of the Rare Earth's Elements. So welcome, Eric. Good morning. Hybrid electric uh, vehicles, fuel cells, large capacity wind turbine generators, and energy efficient lighting. These are all green energy applications that rely on rare earth elements. The rare earth elements are not rare. These are 17 elements that have a particularly similar chemistry among them that makes their separations and purifications difficult. China currently holds more than 95% of the global supply chain of rare earth elements from their mining to their separations to the manufacture of materials. In 2010, China cut their exports by about 40%. 
This has created a significant global shortfall of these elements. And, and, and China have shifted from an exp uh, export-driven market to one where the elements are used internally. Uh, however, this is a tremendous opportunity for innovation for chemists. In my lab, we're working on the fundamental chemistry of rare earths towards applications in an environmentally clean separations process. We expect our discoveries will contribute to a new U.S. domestic supply chain of the elements by reducing costs at the separation stage. These discoveries will help ensure the growth of green energy technology contingent on a steady supply of rare earth elements. Thank you. So thank you, Eric. Now next up is James Sadler, who was a junior in political science. Summer after his freshman year, James was awarded a college undergraduate research and service fellowship, which he used to conduct research in three Philadelphia high schools. There he worked to define the tenets of a successful school examining variables like parental satisfaction, SAT scores, and college acceptance. Today he will discuss chartering a course in education reform. So please join me in welcoming James Sadler. In just two days, Jeffrey Canada will speak at Penn's 256th commencement ceremony. Canada is best known for his incredible work as CEO and president of Harlem Children's Zone and for his appearance in the celebrated documentary Waiting for Superman, which uses Canada to argue that the public education system is broken and that charter schools are the answer. Charter schools are generally free from the strict requirements that plague traditional public schools, and they generate results that definitively prove how we can solve the public education problem, or so the argument goes. What misleading charter proponents like the makers of Waiting for Superman ignore are the uncomfortable facts of charter school performance. A 2009 study from Stanford University shows that only 17% of charters nationwide perform statistically significantly better than the traditional public school counterparts they are supposed to replace. And for every high-performing charter school that exists, like Harlem Children's Zone, there are two charter schools that perform worse than traditional public schools. There is no silver bullet to solve the issues surrounding urban education, and charter schools are no exception. Thank you. Thank you, James. Now I'd like to introduce uh, Marad Idris, uh, a doctoral student in political science. And his research focuses on political theory and Middle East politics, and specifically the idea of peace and how it can both positively and negatively affect a society. Marad has received numerous awards, including an ACLS Mellon Dissertation Completion Fellowship and Penn's GAPSA Provost Award for Interdisciplinary Innovation. And he's currently translating two Arabic medieval philosophy texts as part of a project on the history of advice literature for rulers. And today he will discuss what does Islam and peace mean. Please welcome Murad. Presidents, academics, and journalists around the world say that Islam is peace, while others say, no, it's violent. Here's a historical view of why people talk this way. Rewind, 1850. Hundreds of European scholars studying Islam understood it as whatever they did not want Christianity to be. They defined Islam as submission, unthinking, fatalistic, violent submission, as opposed to Christianity, which is peace, individuality, progress. Fast forward, 1950. Hassan al-Banna, founder of the Muslim Brothers, he took that European discourse about Christianity and turned it around. He said, Europeans say that Islam is violent submission. But Islam comes from the same word as peace, therefore Islam is peace. The idea that Islam is peace was a reaction, response, and continuation of how Europe constructed itself and Islam. And this is why transnational ideas must be understood in relation to one another. Thank you. Thank you, Marad. Now we have the privilege of introducing my colleague in the English department, Herman Beavers, who was the winner of the Judge's Choice Award for last year's 60 Second Slam. Herman is an expert in 19th and 20th century African American and American literature, and his teaching includes courses on Southern modernism, African American poetry, and a course on the literatures of jazz required for the jazz and popular music minor. He's the author of Wrestling Angels into Song, the fictions of Ernest J. Gaines and James Allen McPherson. In addition, Herman is an accomplished poet. So the name of his talk today is The Journey Black, August Wilson's 20th Century Cycle, here to defend his title. Please welcome Herman Beavers.
All but one of the plays in August Wilson's 20th century cycle is set in Pittsburgh's Hill District. The Hill, in a manner of speaking, is Wilson's reinvention of Yakupatawpha County. His characters have names like Slow Drag, Memphis, Stool Pigeon, Whining Boy, and Citizen Barlow. There's Aunt Esther, who lives at 1839 Wiley Avenue, is 322 years old, but doesn't look a day over 100. If you want, she can take you to the city of bones. Listen and learn how to get your soul washed. Why all ham bone says is, he gonna give me my ham. Not to mention Levy, the trumpet player, talking about death will kick your ass and make you wish you was never born. Or ex-Negro leaguer Troy Matson declaring, death ain't nothing but a fastball on the outside corner. But listen closer and you'll understand that the plays in the cycle testify to African American resilience. That Wilson's characters may be isolated, cut off from memory, but each in their way embody Ma Rainey's notion that this be an empty world without the blues. Thank you, Herman. Now, next up to the podium is Shirley Lung, and Shirley is a senior in earth science and biology. In her junior year, she was named a Phi Beta Kappa for distinguishing herself through research and the breadth of her study. And she studies soil erosion and its underlying causes using field research from the Chesapeake Bay and other sites. And today, she'll discuss ocean ecology and the implications for future climate change. So please welcome Shirley Lung. So whenever people ask me what I want to be, and I say biologist and oceanographer, they inevitably ask what my favorite marine creature is. Instead of whales, dolphins, or the like, I always surprise them by saying microscopic little phytoplankton. These single-celled organisms serve as the basic food source for most marine food chains and account for 50% of all photosynthetic activity on Earth, as much as all land plants combined. By conducting photosynthesis, phytoplankton draw CO2 out of the atmosphere and store that carbon in the ocean. This means that phytoplankton are extremely important in reducing global atmospheric CO2 concentrations and slowing global climate change. However, with future warming, phytoplankton populations are predicted to decrease greatly. Because of this, we in the Earth Science Department are conducting research to understand exactly how global warming will affect phytoplankton. In answering these questions, we will be able to better predict future climate change and its consequences for humans. So our next speaker is Peter Sachs Calopy, a doctoral student studying the history and sociology of science. Peter's writing a dissertation examining the relationship between communications technologies and democratic participation. He's delivered presentations at various conferences on topics ranging from cybernetics and the human sciences and the counterculture to Darwinism and religion in 19th century America. So today, Peter will discuss wipe cycle, feedback, and experimental video. Please join me in welcoming the Peter Sachs Colopy. Because I'm speaking about video, I have some for you. So <laughs> patience for a moment, please. In 1969, painter Frank Gillette and psychologist Ira Schneider exhibited this piece, Wipe Cycle, at a New York art gallery. It was not only one of the first multi-channel video installations, but also a window into a political and artistic movement that sought to make television participatory. Wipe Cycle incorporated a camera, and thus its audience. Its nine TV monitors played live images from that camera, intercut with images from several seconds before, as well as pre-taped video and broadcast television. It was intended, according to Gillette, to demonstrate that you're as much a piece of information as tomorrow morning's headlines. What the installation provided to its viewers was feedback, the feature of video that fascinated thousands experimenting with the medium around 1970. From artists to documentarians to psychiatrists and educators, they believed that this new experience of the self could foster mental health and, through cable television, a new democratic forum. Thank you. So, thank you, Peter. Our, our final speaker is Dennis Turk, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences and Robert A. Fox Leadership Professor and Professor of Mathematics. And as Dean, Dennis oversees our undergraduate curriculum, programs, and students. 
He has more than 50 published mathematics papers and was recipient of our highest honors for teaching, including the Ira Abrams Award, the University's Lindbach Award, and the Mathematical Association of America's HIMO Award for distinguished teaching. His previous lecture, Down with Fractions, aimed at getting people to talk about the math curriculum, and it has the honor of being one of our most controversial talks. <laughs> You never know. OK. Um, so today, Dennis will be discussing surprising symmetry. Please give a warm welcome to Dean Dennis de Turk. Thanks, Rebecca. Now, before I start, uh, I'm, because I'm the dean, I get to bend the rules a little bit. Um, so at the end of this lecture, this 60-second lecture, there will be a 30-second quiz. So pay attention. Uh, okay. Uh, for millennia, mathematicians have been known for formulating and proving theorems, fundamental facts about geometry, algebra, and calculus, and their names have become linked with their discoveries. Theorems such as those of Fermat and Pythagoras are well known. Other mathematicians have mathematical objects such as tensors, equations, and functions named for them, but I'm one of the few, if not the only mathematician, to own a trick. <laughs> the basis for my mathematical trick is the exploitation of symmetry to help solve systems of differential equations. Now, we're familiar with geometric symmetry, there you go, um, when we see it, when you can transform an object by moving, reflecting, or rotating it, but some or all of its properties stay the same. Surprising symmetries occur in equations, where transforming one quantity leaves a related quantity unchanged. There it is. Uh, for instance, replacing x by its reciprocal in this expression leaves it unchanged, leading us to expect that the answer to the question is the only number that's the same as its reciprocal, namely x equals 1. Algebraic symmetries help physicists understand subatomic particles, and the sy symmetries among the solutions of an equation can lead to beautiful geometric symmetries, as in this Newton's method fractal. They also form the basis of the de Turk trick. And now it's time for the quiz. Uh, this is the beginning of the second movement of Haydn's Piano Sonata in A, which he composed in 1773. Uh, its second movement, just in case you can't read it, is called Menuet al Rovescio, uh, and I'm going to play the first 20 bars of the, of the, of the movement for you, and the, the object is for you to discover the hidden symmetry. So, so Haydn intended for this to be played forward, and then on the repeat, you play it backwards. So uh, there's a hidden symmetry. There are hidden symmetries everywhere. Thanks. So you can see why he's the dean of our undergraduate college, because he covers everything. So um, thank you, Dennis, and thank you to all the participants. Please, let's give them all a round of applause. Now, now it's time to allow our judges a few minutes to confer and decide on the judges' winner of today's audience slam. All right, we're ready to announce um, the winners. Now I have the results from the judges and our audience poll. Um, and again, here again, many thanks to our judges for their wisdom. If we can applaud them again. Now, before I announce the winners, I do want to mention the background music you were listening to. It was a remix version of past 60-second lectures. Um, CDs of this inspired uh, collection are being given to each of today's speakers, and again, I want to thank them for their participation. And if this has whet your appetite, I do invite you to visit online uh, to hear more of our 60-second lecture archives. Uh, we have bookmarks on the refreshment table that have the URL for the website, and I invite you um, to take one now. For our winners, the judge's choice is Shirley Long, with a shout out to James. So, Shirley. <laughs> and the audience choice 
goes to Elika Bergelson. Yay! <laughs> thank you. I hope you all enjoyed this as much as I did. So thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of Alumni Weekend. Let's get to the parade.